Hi, my name is Dagmar Grefe. I'm a certified ACPE supervisor. I direct the program, uh, the Spiritual Care and Clinical Pastoral Education Program at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. And um, we will talk today, our training session will be um, about competencies for intercultural spiritual care and education. Uh, it will help us to understand and develop intercultural competencies for spiritual care and also the preparation for spiritual care uh, in CPE. Um, working with particular cultures or issues of race, racism, or working with the LGBTQ communities, for example, these would be all presentations that would stand on its own. What we're doing today is an introduction. It's an overarching, uh, it raises overarching themes um, for intercultural relations. So at the end of the session, you should be able to define culture and name the elements of intercultural competency, define concepts from the field of intergroup relations theory, social categorization, social identity, different forms of bias. You should be able to apply these concepts to intercultural relationships and spiritual care and its education and supervision. And you should articulate some concrete approaches to persons of other cultures in spiritual care and education. We'll also do uh, provide some suggestions for curriculum. This next slide um, just gives some reference to the outcomes in uh, level two CPE and for the development of certified educators. Um, these are some of the outcomes that address cultural humility, cultural competency. And I'm not gonna read them for you. Just wanted to be aware of that. How, how this session relates to our ACPE standards. So here's a structure for today's session. We will familiarize ourselves with the definition of culture and intercultural competence. And we will learn some concepts from social identity. Uh, social identity theory is a field within intergroup relations. And that again is a field within social psychology. I have found these concepts very helpful when thinking about self-awareness and relational dynamics between people of different cultures. And then we will apply what we've learned to our context of spiritual care and its education. And we will review some of the key learnings with a quiz. The uh, Chinese artist Yang Lu has captured some of the differences uh, between Eastern and Western culture with some poignant pictograms. And we will look at a few um, that will introduce us in some of the ideas about culture. So the first one that you see shows how different ways, uh, the different ways in which the people in Eastern and Western culture party. Westerners tend to mingle in small groups. You'll see that on the blue uh, pictogram. Uh, Western culture is a more individualized culture and people in the East tend to be more collectivist. And so when Eastern people would walk into a room for a party, they would rather gather in a large group. It's a much more communal approach. Most Western cultures tend to be low context cultures. We approach problems head on and express our opinions in a linear and straightforward fashion. You see that on the left in the blue field. In contrast, people from uh, Asia live in high context cultures. They or pre uh, their opinions are expressed and issues are faced in more indirect ways. And yet people there know what's going on. Think for a moment about the implications for CPE. CPE has developed in a Western culture and our standards pretty much reflect that heritage. We ask our students in CPE groups to express their feedback directly to peers and the supervisor 
And can you imagine how differently this, this must feel for students that come from Western culture versus students that have immigrated from Asia? Another invitation to think now, have you ever discussed those differences in a CPE group or have you ever found yourself adjusting your leadership style? This is some food for thought, we'll move on. These pictures show how differently Eastern and Western cultures view authority figures, such as the boss or the supervisor, the teacher or the doctor. You can see how differently the role of authority is in an Eastern culture compared to West. The second picture show how Westerners and people from Eastern contexts might speak about themselves. The latter, much more forthright and more modestly. The Western styles of self-expression, Western styles of self-expressions self are consistent with a more individualistic culture. And again, when you look at these images, what are the implications for your CPE group leadership style? So what those pictograms show is people experience time, space differently. People use body language and uh, the contact differently. Emotions are differently expressed. For example, in parts of the Middle East, grief is expressed very outwardly with loud crying, gestures and motions. In Asia, grief and sadness may be expressed in more somatic forms, such as a headache or a stomach ache or a pain in the chest. And then in Northern European countries or people who have that heritage, emotions may be experienced very deeply but not expressed necessarily outwardly. And of course, there are a lot of individual differences within cultures. And we've already discussed earlier with the pictograms uh, some difference between individualist and collectivist cultures or high context and low context cultures. So culture includes ideas, values, beliefs, attitudes, ways in which groups of people interpret experiences, language of course, norms and customs, different social relationships, gender, family roles, understanding of health, life, and death. Cultures also organize education, political, and economic life differently. And I just want to bring up one more example, speaking about the social relationships. Um, when you, or the chaplains that you train, work with families, as they have to make medical decisions. Maybe you've had encountered some, some of those family meetings. Um, you probably encountered a lot of families where the nuclear family is the primary decision maker. Whereas in some other cultures, we have Wonder what what has happened, and it may be that after the family conference, they spoke with extended family members who have a significant uh, role in the decision making process, and these family members have not been part of the family conference, and so there is a change. Um, just one example: how social relationships may uh, the cultural differences. Uh, we may come across those um, in our healthcare um, work. So we'll look at a basic decision definition of culture. Culture describes ways in which groups of people develop distinct patterns of life, 
and express their social and material life experience. I'll leave that slide up a little bit. Now, one thing to remember, cultures are dynamic and fluid. They can change and adapt. Think of um, some of the students that you may encounter or some of the patients or families. They may have be here second or third generation versus some other uh, people who have come here uh, for the first time from their home country. So there are changes. Um, the second or third generation have much more integrated uh, Western or American cultural features. And then in a globalized world as today, travel technology, um, you know, has a big influence. And so we, cultures, we influence each other quite a bit. So cultures are really pure. And they're, think of it much more as a, as a mix of influences that changes over time. And then of course, there are a lot of differences, individual differences among people from different cultures. And we will get a little more into this topic later in this presentation. So the notion that's expressed on this slide has been developed by Clacon and Mari in the 50s, and then reinforced by um, Sue and Sue. They are uh, psychologists, and their book, Counseling the Culturally Diverse, is a book I can highly recommend to you um, as you want to deepen your learning around intercultural spiritual care and education. So you can remember the concept on the slide on three fingers. We are unique. Our DNA, our unique character, traits, our gifts, talents, and challenges make us unique. We are like no other. We also have some things in common with people that, um, with whom we share the same cultural context and upbringing. We are like some others. And then third, we are like all others. There are some things that we all experience birth, death, illness. These are things we may interpret slightly different, but we all go through these experience and we have those things in common with all other human beings. And I find, you know, because it's, we can remember it on three fingers, it's a helpful uh, tool to remember when we meet a patient or a student, um, you know, when we do a spiritual and educational assessment. assessment. So Sue and Sue developed um, or said there are three elements of cultural competence. Self-awareness of our own assumptions and bias. Understanding of different worldviews of clients and patients. And then developing appropriate interventions and strategies of assistance. Self-awareness and the understanding that we are all limited by our own cultural context make up cultural humility. And just a reminder, that's actually a term that is in our objectives. And that's very closely connected with respect for difference and also curiosity, a curiosity to really wanna learn about other cultures and to know that we don't know everything and that we often don't even know what we don't know. And so the following part from social psychology will help us to develop this humility, cultural humility or cultural self-awareness. Henry Tushfell and John Turner are two psychologists that developed social identity theory. As a CPE educator, you will develop your own personality theory. Um, and many of those theories look at our personal identity, um, who we are as a unique human being, how we have developed that way. Social psychology looks at us as social beings, our relationships, 
in among in and among social groups. What do you see when you look at this picture? When I show these images to a class, most will say furniture, vegetables, plants. So we tend to organize what we see in our minds and group things together. Psychologists call this process categorization. It's a cognitive process that helps us to organize complex information. And we organize by prioritizing certain similarities and dissimilarities, plants versus furniture, for example. We simplify so we can act in a complex environment. And we do this all the time without even being aware of it. We do this when we go shopping, when we drive. Um, without this process, this cognitive process, we couldn't even function. What do you see now? You see seniors, young people, a Hispanic, an African American, just to sit, name a few examples. So we do the same categorizing process with people, or we can say, or psychologists call it, with social information. Usually what we see first when we see another person is skin color, gender, age, and psychologists call this process social categorization. Just like with other information, we organize social information. Persons with similar characteristics, we group them together and we group those with different characteristics in a different category. And that structures our social world. So we have a social identity, not only a personal identity as a unique human being, but also an identity as a social being. We belong to social groups, not just groups in a narrow sense, people with whom we interact, but also groups as categories, such as nationality, ethnicity, religion, and there are even professional groups, such as chaplains versus congregational ministers, or chaplains versus nurses, or chaplains versus physicians. And we often have, I mean, we all have memberships in different groups at the same time. For example, you may be a mother who is an engineer, an American citizen of Pakistani background, and a practicing Muslim. So in that, I just mentioned five memberships in different groups. And the membership, being part of a group, gives us a sense of belonging and self-esteem. And maybe I can go back. Um, here in LA, we have Koreatown. We have, for example, um, you know, we have a, many Korean churches. And so the churches have, of course, a role in, you know, in nurturing religious identity, but it's also a space where people can meet with others um, that share their heritage and also kind of nurture their cultural heritage. So um, churches, religious groups often have, are carriers of cultural identity as well. So these concepts are from the field of intergroup relations um, a field within social psychology that understands the relationships between different social groups. And part of our social identity is our belonging to a social group or category, as we've said. And so in-groups are the groups with which we identify and to which we feel we belong. And out-groups are the groups to which we feel we do not belong and with which we do not identify. And so I'm just bringing this up because the word, the term in-group and out-group comes, comes up a lot in the field of social psychology. When we don't know somebody from another group, we tend to rely heavily on categorization. You've probably heard the term, they all look alike, referring to people of a different ethnicity or a social group. 
think of an example from your own life when you've met somebody first and how the idea of that person has changed when you got to know them personally. They kind of moved away from being just a category to being much more nuanced. And so far we have looked at categories we form in our heads about other people and that's a very normal cognitive process. So we generalize and miss a lot of unique personality traits when we meet somebody from another group first. But usually over time that changes when we meet them personally. The more you get to know a person, the more the image in your mind becomes nuanced and richer. At least if you have somewhat of an open mind. signs, Appalachians are rednecks. So Mexican would be the category. Lazy is the stereotype, the trait that's associated with the, with the cognitive category. Stereotypes types can be negative or positive. For example, a positive one would be Asians are good in math. And you might think just take a moment to think of any stereotypes that you have heard or are aware of. So once again, stereotypes are not identical with categorization. Most often they are below our awareness because we are ashamed of them, we don't always have an easy time of recognizing them. But it's very human to have stereotypes and they tend to get less in the way the more we become aware and can acknowledge them. So as a supervisor, as a chaplain, it's actually pretty important to you know, work on bringing any stereotypes we may have to our awareness. And our peer group can actually help very much with that. Another piece, stereotypes are pretty persistent. I remember a discussion in our CPE group once when one of the students brought up um, how Muslims um, are very reluctant sometimes at hospital admissions to uh, let other people know about their, you know, their religion being Muslim because they fear prejudice in our time. And one of the students said, well, it's understandable that people are skeptical of Muslims because of radical Islam. And I said, what about Dr. Such and Such? Um, this is a Dr. Such and Such is a Muslim. I'm, I'm just using that. It's a Muslim doctor on our professional advisory board. And the student responded, well, Dr. Such and Such is different. Psychologists call this refencing. Instead of changing our mind and softening our stereotypes about Muslims in general, we would declare something that does not fit into this mental field as an exception. So we refence our mental field again by saying, oh, this person is an exception. And so the stereotype can persist. So we work pretty hard on keeping our stereotypes, but again, CPE groups actually can be a wonderful tool to work through some of that, to get to know people who are different in, in, on a really personal level and can um, help us to soften or change stereotypes. One thing to remember in healthcare, as chaplains, nurses, physicians, we work in crisis. We work under a lot of stress. And when we are in stress, we tend to think less clearly. So we um, tend to rely more on stereotyping. Stereotypes are cognitive. They are, as I 
you know, if, if I repeat the definition, stereotypes are traits, characteristics, characteristics or traits associated with a category. So it's a very cognitive process, and yet they can trigger emotions such as fear, also attraction or disgust. And so Stefan and Stefan are two psychologists, they uh, talked or they, they kind of researched a little bit how some of these concepts associated with stereotypes contribute to a sense of threat. So negative stereotypes are when we expect negative or prob problematic interactions with members from the out group. For example, let's say you're on call or you visit a Latino male patient with a shaved head and tattoos all over his neck and head. You might expect that you're talking to a gang member, gang member and you would probably more guard it than you might be with another person. So it might even shape your interactions um, and your openness with that person. Intergroup anxiety is when we're unfamiliar or with another culture or we might feel incompetent when we encounter persons of another culture just because we don't know them. For example, chaplains may be reluctant to visit a Hindu patient or an Orthodox Jewish family because they're unfamiliar with the tradition, how to relate to the family or what issues might come up. Um, fearing negative stereotyping or judgment from the other. Some patients may not reveal everything to the medical team because they fear judgment, especially minority patients. For example, we have some patients here who um, rely on curanderos, which are folk healers in their tradition, some alternative healing, um, and they may not bring that up, they may not reveal that to the healthcare provider because they fear judgment. Or gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender CPE students may not feel safe to reveal their sexual orientation in a CPE group depending on who else is in the group or how welcoming the setting is. Or they just, you know, may have some anxiety because, you know, of the general climate in society, having negative stereotypes. Symbolic threat is something that also very much relates to um, the world of religion. When values are questions or threatened through different worldviews, um, especially in a very diverse society like ours, where Christianity is not the only primary visible tradition. Um, some people may, maybe some of our students might have a sense of threat. I'm remembering when I was working in a congregation in Germany, um, some parishioners became upset when the call to Muslim prayer sounded um, on Fridays from loudspeakers in the town. And they felt really a sense of threat by having another culture be so visibly or audibly pr present. So bias, and remember, one of our objectives is to become aware of our own assumption of bias. We can kind of, this is a good slide to review what we've looked at so far. Bias has cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and attitudinal aspects. So it has cognitive. You know, we all talked about stereotyping or having stereotypes, which stereotypes can often trigger emotions such as fear, threat, also attraction, positive feelings. And... It has behavioral aspects. Behavioral components of bias are discri discriminatory actions. It could be verbal judgments, microaggressions, but it can also be things like overlooking certain persons, such as a teacher calling primarily on white students 
or chaplain neglecting to visit patients from other faiths or people speaking another primary language. And prejudice is a biased attitude towards another group of people. So we've covered some concepts from social identity theory that I think might be help, might help us to um, develop self-awareness um, or work on that in ourselves. And now we're gonna look a little bit at spiritual care and educational implications. The first one I brought up is something that I found also very helpful, a concept. Um, I kind of put it under counter-transference. Um, it's sort of like our responses to another person um, that we meet, that we work with. And a lot of us are familiar with the uh, term xenophobia, the fear or the ambivalence when meeting a person from another outgroup. And I think we've even talked a little bit about that when we talked about the sense of threat right before. But uh, German pastoral theologian Eberhard Hausschild also brought up the term xenophilia. So xeno is foreign, philia is friendship, or it would be a more positive attitude towards somebody who is different. And it's basically considering the other as better or overlooking differences or areas of disagreement. So these would be when we're really enchanted with another culture or somebody that we meet, a student or somebody seems very different, interesting and exotic, and we may actually idealize the other person. Or we may overcompensate for bias against this person that we see in the rest of society or others. And that does not really do justice to the other person either as we overlook some parts of their um, personality um, or we don't really realize aspects of their identity. And so when we supervise people, it's something to be really mindful of as well. And I thought that was a really helpful concept for me. That's why I put it in. Another concept that has been developed by the pastoral theologian James Poling, um, and also is very much picked up by Emmanuel Larte, um, is the idea of cultural normativity. It looks at power dynamics in intercultural relationships. So members of dominant cultures are often less aware of cultural differences. Or another popular way to say it, as a bumper sticker says, if you don't have to think about it, it's a privilege. And so members of minority cultures often can feel left out and experience discrimination. And the members of the dominant culture are just not aware of that. Um, And so the role of the spiritual caregiver or the educator would be that of empowering the other person. And the following case example will illustrate this idea of cultural normativity. Tom Bear is a Native American veteran who recently retired from a local paper plant where he was a supervisor. Mr. Bear lived in a suburb in a large metropolitan area. One Sunday afternoon, he experienced severe chest pains. His wife, Alice, called 911, and an ambulance took the bears to a neighboring suburban hospital. Alice is a retired nurse, and she had a conversation with the emergency room physician, and she was alarmed when she learned that he had prescribed for her husband medication that is commonly used to treat chronic alcoholism. And when she protested that her husband had never had an alcohol problem, the doctor walked away from her. Tom remained in the hospital for two weeks and then he died. 
The Bears' two sons, Bill and Tom Jr., were present at his death and sang funeral chants at their father's bedside. A nurse entered the room, heard the chants, and called hospital security to remove those drunken Indians from the hospital. And shortly after, the security guards hustled Tom and Bill from the room. Tom's doctor arrived at the, to announce that an autopsy should be performed to convince Alice to sign a form agreeing to the autopsy. Tom's tribe was firmly opposed to autopsies. And I'm giving the reference of where you can find this example as well as other examples of cultural or ethnic variations in dealing with death and dying. We're gonna stop this for a while, this presentation, to have you think of the following questions. What examples of cultural insensitivity are revealed in this episode? How might the reactions of the staff at the hospital, how might that, those reactions reflected the perceptions of dominant society? What might be some of the assumptions that underlie the responses of the healthcare team in this case? What forms of bias are present? And if you were called as a chaplain, how would you hope to have reacted? Or how might you assist in this situation? So we'll take a few moments to think about this. Looking at the first two questions, one of the issues of um, ignorance or of yeah, cultural insensitivity is assuming alcoholism and actually misdiagnosing the patient. The ignorance and disrespect for ritual chanting and not knowing about diverse different views regarding autopsy. Another example might be of you know, the dominant society um, that saying goodbye to a dying person must be quiet and removing family members from the room or the doctor walking away from the family after being questioned. We also see the examples of stereotyping, all Indians are alcoholics, or the chanting in this case was seen as a result of alcohol or an influence of alcohol. So how might you as a chaplain assist? One way might be to create a space for the ritual by informing other patients or staff what the ritual might be like, what to expect, and to assist the family, make the space hospitable for them. Another opportunity might be if you're part of the doctor's meeting with Mrs. Bear, you might advocate for her by saying, have you been able to address all your questions, to give space for her, or you might just simply raise awareness with the doctor or the nurses. Um, about the different cultures and beliefs regarding the integrity of the body or the sacred moments. You might invite Mrs. Bear to share about her culture. And that would be kind of your role as an advocate, you know, in terms of advocating or empowering. In our last part of our presentation, we'll look at educational implications.
So we want to review some suggestions of how we can teach cultural humility and self-awareness in our CPE curricula. Just as bias has cognitive, emotional, and behavioral aspects, so our education can target head, heart, and hand. So here are just some examples. Um, let the students teach about their culture. Um, let us use the resources that we have with students um, and maybe you know, teaching their peers about their culture, their cultural heritage, um, sometimes even meals, uh, potlucks where people bring food from their uh, culture um, is, a, is a really fun way to celebrate diversity and learn about other traditions. We've done that in our uh, group a lot. You might also highlight cultural differences in group work, kind of like different styles of communicating uh, like we mentioned earlier in the presentations when we looked at Western and Eastern cultures, if you see something like that, stop and teach, highlight it in the here and now. It's a wonderful teaching moment. Also, you might have students of two different cultures work together to research a third culture. Um, we have, for example, I have a group right now with a Korean and an Armenian student and they, they wanted to learn about gay and lesbian, uh, the gay LGBT community. And so that's something that um, they work on together. And don't forget the notion of hybridization, um, that cultures often are mixed and change and are rarely pure. One tool that I have worked with quite a bit that I find very helpful is um, the narrative cultural autobiographies. Um, maybe some of you have worked with story theology in your groups, or you probably have an autobiography at the very beginning when the group gets to know each other. And I have used this a little bit into the um, unit, maybe around mid unit. Um, where, where the students, one group session is devoted to one cultural autobiography of a group member. So they prepare a little um, narrative that they share and I provide guiding questions for them and usually allow room for questions. So the presentation shouldn't be longer than 30 minutes and then everybody can engage the story. I found that to be a really nice tool for students to get to know their own cultural story because oftentimes we may have Caucasian students who have never really thought about their own cultural heritage, but they also learn a lot from their peers um, and their stories. Um, for example, we had like in one group, a very, a student who was coming from a very affluent background and another student who came over here with his brother um, from Mexico, you know, overnight through the desert. And there's just a lot of learning uh, from each other. I'm gonna give a few of the guiding questions that I, uh, that I ask my students to address. How would you describe your cultural identity? That's cultural heritage, ethnic cultural roots, social class, religious identity. How does this identity impact you today? Do you nurture your heritage in any way? What have you learned from your cultural heritage about health, illness, and its treatments, physical, mental, and death? Now, this is because I work primarily in healthcare. If you work in a different setting, there might be other ways um, where you can make connections to cultural heritage to your clinical context. And then, some examples, how is health maintained? Are there taboos? What are attitudes towards health professionals? Alternative treatment methods? Are there customs of support for persons in the family system who are ill? And then, have you been exposed to cultural approaches differently from your own? 
So these are just some suggestions. Um, let's wrap up with a quiz that reviews some of the concept that we've learned. So we learned Sue and Sue have reinforced this that in some aspects, everyone has something in common with everyone else, is a unique individual. And what was the other one? What's missing in two? Everyone is like some others. So is unique, three is like some others, like two and has something is like everyone else. Next question. Social categorization is another form for prejudice. Is that true or false? It's false. Social categorization is simply a cognitive process of organizing information. Prejudice, just as a, you know, recall, when you recall that uh, big image uh, describing bias, prejudice has attitudinal kind of reinforced um, attitudinal components of bias. Stereotype is a strong negative emotional reaction to members of another group. Is that true or false? It's false. Stereotype is a cognitive process but it can trigger emotional reactions. Culture describes fairly prescribed and firm ways in which groups of people of different localities develop distinct patterns of life and express their social and material life experience. Is this definition of culture correct or incorrect? It's false because cultures are fluid and can change. Intercultural anxiety is rooted in unfamiliarity with a particular culture, feelings of incompetence when meeting members of a different culture, anticipating negative stereotypes. Is it the first and second one, second or third, or all three? The correct is F, because all three contribute to a sense of threat. Here are some resources that I refer to in my presentation. If you want to dig deeper in the material of this presentation, uh, you can look at my book, Encounters for Change. Another good overview is uh, Sue and Sue, Counseling the Culturally Diverse. And if you answer the questions for reflection on the following site, you will be registered as having completed the course. Thank you. <laughs>